New Testament books begin with the greatest theme in all the Bible, and that is uh, the kingdom of God. In fact, when, when Jesus in Mark 1.15 introduced himself to the world for the first time, his first words were that the kingdom of God has come near, and that they were to repent and believe in, in the good news. And then when you get to the end of the book of Acts, which kind of finishes the historical period of the New Testament, the, the final verses of, the, of Acts chapter 28, verse 31 say that Paul was speaking about the kingdom of God and also teaching about the Lord Jesus. There is nothing greater than the kingdom of God and also nothing greater than the king. And that's why I believe the greatest thing in all of our lives is actually knowing him, knowing the king of the kingdom of God. In, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 13, the scripture says, if you are pleased with me, teach me your way. This is Moses talking. He said that I may know you, that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And in the New Testament, in Philippians 3, verse 10, the scripture says, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So the greatest reality, again, in time and eternity is this thing we call the kingdom of God. And the greatest one to know, obviously, of that incredible kingdom is to know the king himself. Where Psalm 145, verse 3 says, Great is the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. In fact, I learned many years ago, when you're kind of thinking about the important things in life, you know, what you might call life 101, I actually think that the worst subject of all time is the subject of sin. It's the ugliest, it's the most horrible, it's created the most damage you know, on the planet. It's, it's the worst thing you could ever study, is what is sin and what has it done to the universe. On the opposite side, the most wonderful thing we could ever give our time contemplating and thinking about is the, the wonderful subject of God himself. What kind of a king rules the universe? What is he like? And how can I get to know him uh, in a personal way? And how should we approach getting to know God? Well, I think we need to do it in a lot of different ways, but that certainly includes uh, humbly, reverently, excitedly, lovingly, and with passion. And how do we actually get to know Him? Is that just a matter of kind of our pursuit? Well, the Bible actually teaches that God Himself has revealed Himself to us. And that's how we get to know Him. We get to know Him through creation which theologians call general revelation. Romans 1, 19 and 20 talks about that, as well as Psalm 19, 1 to 4. He reveals himself that design points to a designer. Number two, we also get to know him through his word. The theologians call that special revelation. He's actually spoken and given us a book, an incredible book. Psalm 119, verse 160, and also 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. Talk about the specialness of the Bible. As the greatest book ever written, God revealing himself to, to people. We also get to know God through our conscience because he speaks to us into every individual heart, showing us right from wrong. I call that personal revelation. So there's general revelation, there's special revelation, there's personal revelation. Romans 2.15 talks about that, God writing his law upon our hearts. And then number four, we also get to know God through <clears throat> relational revelation. Psalm 78 verses 1 to 4. We get to know him in people because Christ is in them, the hope of glory and those who follow him and who love him. So on all kinds of levels, God has revealed himself. And the greatest thing you want to pursue in your life, the number one thing you want to study, the number one thing you want to think about, the number one person you want to get to know is to get to know the God of reality, the God of the kingdom, the king of the kingdom of God. And in this series, we actually want to talk about what are some of the self-evident truths of that kingdom. Actually, six things that I think are obvious, they're self-evidence, that we're all aware they exist, they're realities. And the first one is the one we've just introduced. The first self-evident truth is that God exists. He exists. He's there. He's real. And in this session, we want to talk about the nature and character of God, and some questions that relate to his reality. In fact, his greatest and most wonderful name is the name I am. <laughs> he is the greatest reality. And I want to begin by talking about what we call the transcendent natural 
attributes of God, the transcendent natural attributes or characteristics of his being. The word transcendence literally means the nature of God is above. It's different from man. It's even unapproachable. The divine reality is not limited to the natural order, but he's far, far bigger than that. He transcends it. He's above it all. And he has some incredible natural characteristics. In fact, we could kind of put it this way. He's the most high God. The most high God. And that is a God that we are to fear in in the rightest sense. He's holy. He's great. He's far away in some ways. He's beyond us, that's for sure. He's eternal, he's above, he's a king, he's majestic, in in various ways inaccessible, beyond us, exalted, holy other. In fact, I really believe we should reserve a word that's become popular in our day, we should reserve it for God, it's the word awesome. There is only one being that is full of awe because of how great he is, and because of how big he is. And we wanna talk about a number of those characteristics we should be in awe of, things that relate to who he is that are again part of his self-existence as the first self-evident truth. The first thing we wanna talk about is kind of uh, understood, and it's, it's basically this, God is the uncreated creator of the universe. He's the only thing that's uncreated, and he created the entire universe. In Genesis 1, verse 1, it talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. In Isaiah 40, verse 28, uh, Isaiah refers to the everlasting God who is the creator of the ends of the earth. And in Psalm 148, verses 1 to 6, we find these words. And this is what we should do because of his creation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that they will never pass away. So I think we we understand that God is the first cause But maybe we've never thought about the fact that he's the only being who is uncreated. He's always been there. And from him, everything was created. And and that reality, him being the awesome, uncreated creator of the universe, that answers a number of questions. Where did everything come from? What was the first cause? You know, and uh, why are we here and all that we see around us? So we we begin by saying God is first, he's the creator, he's an uncreated creator, he made all that there is, and and we stand on the foundation of that and all the reality that projects. A second thing we want to mention about God's natural characteristics, these are his transcendent abilities, is that he's not singular. He's actually a triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A very unique idea to time, eternity, and theology, but something that makes an awful lot of sense when you think about it. God is one in three, three in one, three persons in one essence and entity. And we find this all throughout the Bible in a variety of ways. For example, in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, Jesus' son is praying to the Father, And the Holy Spirit descends upon him as a dove, the three manifesting themselves in that passage. In 2 Corinthians 13, 14, we find these words as a benediction. May the grace of Jesus and may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be be with you. Again, mentioning all three, three in one. In John 14, 26, Jesus is again talking to God the Father and he's speaking about the Holy Spirit and talks about when the Helper comes from the Father, he will reveal me. So again, the threefold expression there uh, of, the, of the Godhead. And of course, in Matthew 28, verse 19, we have the famous Great Commission verse, which says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So even though the concept of the Godhead is a, an awesome one, one to, we can't really contemplate, the older I've gotten, the more I've thought about it, 
God being three and being one makes an awful lot of sense because he's not singular. A singular being would have no one to love, would be involved in no aspects of love. In fact, the greatest thing about the Godhead to me is that it gives meaning to all love relationships. We have God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit loving each other from all eternity and at a point in time inviting angels and human beings into that, that circle of love. So the question the Trinity really answers is, what's the origin of all love and relationships? A singular God or no God answers that. A triune God answers it beautifully. And another thing that's kind of curious to me is, why is the three pattern so common in life? And you find it everywhere, from the three forms that water can take to many other things. There seems to be something about threes. Well, that seems to go back to the three-in-one God, who again made heaven and earth, and is the greatest reality that there is. 